most of us looking at the stock market are probably perplexed and baffled by some of the things it's been doing. The market is kind of shaken off this like a golden retriever getting out of the water. And uh, it tends to be ignoring a lot of the signs out there. We will talk a little bit about infection vector. I've got a couple pieces of good data on that. And I'm gonna make some comparisons to other places. Warning, I will editorialize occasionally. I try to present the facts as I know them. Um, if my uh, pseudo biases to certain things like not necessarily trusting data out of China reflect uh, those opinions are my own and, and not the opinions of my firm necessarily. So um, we're, we're an independent financial services firm. We are just actually studying this. I head up our research team and I also do the research team for uh, MICPA on new tax law changes. When the CARES Act came out, I spent uh, a good part of 24 hours reading the whole thing and getting out in my Forbes column that I do. And uh, I, I will, if you have questions about CARES, there is a new, one more bill rolling through the House and another bill rolling out of the Senate. Uh, if we get time at the end, I'd like to talk about that. So uh, we'll start out with a financial market update, then I'm gonna go to some history, and then I'm gonna talk about the prospects of the election. So we'll start with what we're monitoring. Um, we're actually looking very carefully at how this whole thing is shaking out. And I, I, I want you all to understand that what has been in the past is not necessarily what we think is going to be in the future. Um, we had a change in the last 90 days, and it's hard to believe it's literally to the day, almost a quarter. It's been, we're, we're, we've been into this for 90 days, or depending on how you want to count it, 120 days. Uh, an unprecedented thing that's happened to the world. And, and it's, a, it's a pandemic. And it's an economic problem not caused by us. So I've studied the last 11 recessions since World War II, and every single one of them been caused by us. And, you know, I can show you that in every case, the Fed tightened interest rates too hard before the recession, so the Fed's fingerprints were all over the death of the recovery. Or I can show you that in 1973, we had a spike in oil prices of 100% a month. Or I can show you that in, 19, in, 19, uh, two, in the year 2000, we had the tech bubble burst and that could be coming from there. So in every case, there's been human fingerprints over these economic disasters. In this case, there wasn't. Uh, we had a pandemic, and I, I had to go back to 1918 to see what that looked like, and believe it or not, we'll go back to 1918. Um, I, I am gonna wanna talk about the second and third levels. You know, What is this going to mean? So let's think this out. First and foremost, we had a gigantic, an enormous amount of fiscal change and, and regulatory change. I mean, I've never seen this in the 43 years I've been in business. So I've, been, I've been working as a CPA or an attorney for 43 years or a professor, and literally nothing has ever been like the magnitude of the changes we've seen. I mean, we changed, we changed the small business association rules. We changed unemployment rules. We changed the Fed's rules on lending. We changed the rules on taxation. And we did that all in basically five days when we passed the CARES Act, and it's, it's incredible. What's more incredible is we threw $5 trillion into the economy and it came from somewhere. And I want all of us to think about how are we gonna pay this piper? Who and who is going to pay this piper? What does it mean to interest rates and what does it mean to dollar and what does it mean to other things? So, so first and foremost, we have this regulatory upheaval. The second thing I think we have is we have a cultural upheaval. And that cultural upheaval is, and, and, and we aren't noticing it yet, but we all got burnt by this and it's changing our habits. So if you look at the real estate market, it's crazy and the residential is terrible in the commercial. I mean, go try to, you know, go try to rent some office space right now. Not easy, but go look at the residential market, particularly outside the cities, huge. And I think we're seeing a flight coming out of cities and out of crowded areas into bigger homes, homes that have offices, other things, and couple that with extraordinarily low interest rates and low mortgage rates, and there's a change there. There's similarly a change in the younger generations. I think we look at the, the Gen X's, Y's, and Z's and call them the millennials or whatever. The, the boomers went through different things and we're all shaped by what happens to us early in our lives. And I, I suggest respectfully, we're gonna see an exacerbation of the change in how the generations work. You're gonna see the next generation, the newer generation, much more on experiential, much less on possessory, much less on reliance on things, saying, hey, this could happen again. And I mean, all we have to do is get burnt once. And think about folks who are still nervous about the market from the decade and a half, that you know, the 12 years ago when we were in 2008. Oh, I don't want that to happen again. It's 12 years. We had 12 years and we had the longest economic expansion in history, but everybody's still antsy about that. And I remember my parents were depression or they never forgot it. They never forgot the depression. 
So there is going to be, I think, a societal shift as well. And then the third thing is a communication shift. I mean, you're going to see a lot, a lot more people working part-time from home or from other places or wherever. I mean, I'm in my office today, but I could just as easily have been up at Torch Lake, or I could have been over on the west side of the state, or I could be almost anywhere. So those are things that we want to look at is, is that triad of shift. And that triad is going to continue, I believe, as we roll toward November and as we roll toward the election. And I do want to touch base on that. So I'll start out with some basic things on financial markets and where we're at. So I, I talked to two of our larger uh, managers, Vanguard Equity Income Manager and the PIMCO Income Fund Manager. Not an endorsement of those, but we do use those in our portfolios. And I said, where are we going and what's happening? And so first and foremost, here's the general consensus from both of them. Number one is they think they, A, things are gonna change particularly in different companies. We're gonna see how things work out with financials versus energy versus manufacturing those kinds of things. Our Vanguard equity managers are saying that they like having dividends in the meantime because they can't see lots of fixed income return. They're only seeing ways to do that in terms of dividend type payments. And I'm getting a consensus from lots of our managers that they think the supply chain is coming back toward the United States. Uh, it does appear to me from talking to DC and just getting the temperature of everyone, a lot of people are blaming China for a lot of this problem. And I think China is becoming more the villain and the foil for what's happening. And I wouldn't be surprised to see us shortening supply chains or bringing supply chains back home or bringing them back to North America. And I think we're gonna see that as well. So you're gonna see a supply chain shift and you're gonna see a shift in, in basically the types of equities that make money. Uh, I'm baffled by some of the things that are going on in the markets. The airlines are starting to rock again. It's crazy. Uh, I've even seen that the cruise ships are starting to come back, the stocks of the cruise ships coming back. So the things we expect have changed. Um, I caution and I, I worry, and, and my Vanguard people say the same thing. You know, right now we're going, wow, the stock market is just about back to where it is. I want you to think of, of the letters FANGAM, F-A-N-G-A-M. That's Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, Apple, Microsoft. They're 21% of the S&P 500, but they're six stocks. And they represent 21% of the return and they're all pretty much positive. So almost all of what's happening in the S&P 500 is being driven by those technology stocks. I ask you, our listeners, do you think that Amazon is going to have the same surge in business once we have a vaccine? Do you think people are gonna watch, or do you think people are gonna be watching Netflix as much when we have the surge over. In other words, how much of that is a surge temporarily? And then my other question is, I want you to think about this please. Google gets its money from advertising. It seems to me as we start actually in a real full-fledged recovery, that businesses might not spend as much money on advertising, that that might not work out as well, that I can't see that upward trajectory necessarily in that same pattern. So we are cautious about the FANGAMs, and we're a little bit more optimistic about the rest of the stocks out there, stocks that have good consumer values, other things. And, and, and of course, there's the normal suspects of things that appear to be overvalued like Clorox and Kimberly Clark. And the, you know, the, who would have thought that the most important commodity in March of 2020 would have been toilet paper? So Jan, we start, do have a question for you. I'm sorry sure, Lori, to go ahead. interrupt. Um, no, go ahead. I wanted to know if you could say that acronym again of the companies that make up uh, the 26% of the S&P. Yes, Fang, again? Yeah, FANGAM, F-A-N-G-A-M. So, you know, Facebook, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google, yeah. Amp, Apple, and Microsoft. Great. And for fun, go look at the charts of those stocks and then compare it to the charts of other things in there like you know, Black and Decker or, or Procter & Gamble or Kimberly Clark, even, even ones that have been doing well, well, well Lowe's and Home Depot. So um, interesting one. I'm, I'm, I'm cautious of the fangs, just like a snake. I'm, I don't want to get bit. So I don't want to get, I don't want to get bit by the fang. Great. Uh, let's okay. go to the, Carry on. Thanks. <laughs> let's go to the fixed income side. Let's go to interest rates. Um, I talked to PIMCO. PIMCO is one of the biggest uh, fixed income managers and they, they sent me this nice little chart of their concentric circles. And they said, center of the chart is riskless stuff. And riskless also means returnless. Uh, if you want to go get Fed funds right now, congratulations, zero. In fact, it's theoretically possible we could go negative. Uh, Europe has been negative in, in their uh, lending rates for a while. Uh, same thing with three-month T-bills and commercial paper, or even two-year notes. The rates are almost nothing. By the way, business owners should be thinking about the fact that that also means that intrafamily loan rates are extremely low. Mortgage rates are extremely low. 
and the valuation rates on certain transfers that we can make within our businesses, things like intentionally defective grantor trusts or a grantor reserved annuity trust, the, the Trump family and the Walton family movements are, are crazy. They're crazy low, which means huge opportunity for wealth transfers in that end. Intermediate long-term treasuries, again, almost nothing. So my blue circles aren't giving me any return, but they're not giving me much risk. To get any kind of return, I have to start slipping out into the gray circles, which is bank debt and other things. And what we're seeing right now is we're seeing that the Fed has actually been buying junk bonds. And who to thunk that? I mean, it's one of those crazy things. Uh, needless to say, we're finding not much attractiveness in the fixed income space, except as a safety net. All we're saying is let's get some money there and make it safe. We have, we're having a hard time finding good income in that spot. Uh, by the way, a uniform message I keep hearing from all the managers are uh, emerging markets, that they think the dollar is going to weaken. That's one strategy that we're going to have to do to get out of the mess. And a weak dollar is really good for emerging markets, at least theoretically. So kind of contemplate that. Um, this chart shows uh, what's called the equity risk premium. And, and you'll notice that the equity risk premium will spike up during times of turbulence and then people will get complacent like they did, you know, in, in 18. And like at the end of 18, some of us may remember Christmas Eve, the stock market tanking uh, and the equity risk premium shot up. Uh, if you notice my chart, it really, really shot up uh, in March. And the news was, wow, it was blasted through the roof. And uh, I want you to notice it shot up and it shot right back down. It literally shot down right down to the average of four, four percent. So that's this is the difference between what the S and P's earnings yield is and ten-year U.S. Treasuries. Now, to be sure, we're going to get earnings this quarter, and they're going to look terrible, uh, no question. And the market's already taken that into account. But if you flip that chart in your mind's eye over, you're seeing a V, and the market seems to be reacting toward a V. So I'm going to get into those shapes a little bit more. So let's carry on now. Uh, what are we doing then? We're being defensive. Um, we, we have, in our, in our portfolios, what we did is we put a little bit into the market, right, in the March low, took some money out of bonds and put it in stocks just a little bit. We're underweighting international. Uh, we are rebalancing, and we're staying a little bit defensive. And I just pose that this is a time to be defensive. We had a remarkable uh, comeback. It's not fully there, but it certainly is not what we thought. I want all of you to think back. If we'd have been talking on March 31st, I mean, it looked like the world was ending. The market was down, you know, at that point, I believe about 30%. And you'd have said, whoa, this is terrible. And, and I want you to look at it right now. It's actually recovered significantly in, uh, in different places, a secular recovery. So here are my questions. What's the perspective shape of this recovery? A V, a U, a W, or an L? How is this different from other disasters? How is this different from World War II? How is this different? And by the way, I'm, I'm going to show you some similarities that scare me. What is this new paradigm we've talked about? And then how much is this thing really going to cost? I'm, I'm thinking about my next Forbes article, and I want you to think this one out. There's a bunch of people out there right now collecting unemployment. And that ends, by the way, right now, as far as we see it, July 31st. So on July 30, right now, they're getting $600 plus Michigan unemployment, which puts them at about 900 bucks a week. And 900 bucks a week, and they're not paying into Social Security, and they're not paying into Medicare. So that's about 56 grand a year. Not a lot of people, not everybody makes 56 grand a year or more. Some people are making 28 grand a year. What happens when your unemployment runs out, you go back to work making 28 grand, and now you're paying into your social security taxes again, and maybe you were a student, you had student loans, and your student loans were in abatement. I mean, if you were, a, if you were making 30 grand, say you were a barista at Starbucks, and you were making uh, 36,000 bucks a year, and now you're collecting $900 a week, not having to work, and you've got no student loan payments, and you've got lease abatement on your leases and your car lease, and your insurance went down, your car insurance went down, and you're not paying your social security, and then you go back. I just, I asked this question, what's next? We might get a second hit, not caused by the stimulus, but caused by the withdrawal of the stimulus. It's almost like everybody got sick. In fact, not everybody got sick, but we fed everybody as if they were sick, and we gave them spoonfuls of great chicken noodle soup, and we gave them all this other stuff, and we took really good care of them, and we pampered them, and we gave them a back rub, and we put a nice soft blankets on them, and now we go back and go, all right, get back out there and get to work. And it's, it's a different paradigm. Um, the, this cost, by the way, goes into effect that I think, you know, I'm looking at second and third levels. I'm looking at Social Security Administration. For basically three months, you've had 25% of the country not paying into Social Security. That's big because Social Security is very tenuously balanced. That's just a minor piece. What happens to the state of Michigan? What happens to hospitals? What happens, you know, just simple, simple pieces of it. And then just take a look at the simple tax revenue. 
I've been talking about net operating losses and things that are happening. What I call the hidden stimulus in the CARES Act is this NOL carryback. You realize that probably almost no corporate, there'll be probably no net corporate income tax paid in 2020. And same thing with pass-through owners. Pass-through owners will take those losses, write them off against their income tax returns, and that's going to make a big difference. And then we will talk more about what changes and what are the second and third level effects. So here's a chart. I'm just for, for your amusement. I wanted to go back to uh, what happens with gross domestic product per capita on a purchasing power basis. So what this is, is how much the average person in the United States made in terms of gross domestic product between 1910 and 1955. All right, so the little red lines and the red spots are, are recessions. And if you'll notice, you'll see different kinds of shapes. So if you look out to post-World War II, you see a pretty kind of clear W. Uh, you look to the Great Recession, the Great Depression, you see a W. I wanna go focus on one that's pretty important, and that is what happened in 1918. Actually, let's go to 1917, because that's when my dad was born. 1917, relatively low taxes. In fact, I'm gonna overlay tax rates here. Here we go. So in 1917, tax rate was 15 percent. Uh, 1916, tax rate was 15 percent. Uh, you had World War I going on, and then 1917, starting to roll into 1917, we got a pandemic, and it was the Spanish flu. Um, go look at history. The Spanish flu killed more people in 1917 and 18 than all of World War I. All of World War I. Now, I went to the University of Detroit, and there's, an, there's a monument at U of D's campus that says, to the Great War, because then they never thought they were going to have a World War II. They thought they were only going to have one. This was the world's, the war to end all wars is what they called it. But if you take a look in terms of what happened, we had a pandemic that killed potentially 100 million people worldwide in 1918. Now, note what happened then afterwards. We had one of the worst, nastiest downturns in the economy in 1920 as a result of that. We got out of World War I, we had all this decimation caused by the human capital loss, the human loss of pandemic, plus the economic and human loss of World War I. We had a vigorous, ugly, ugly downturn in the market in 1920, caused the depression, immediate depression, terrible depression, terrible stock market crash. No one knows about it because we all paid attention to 1929 and actually not a whole bunch of people are around that were around in 1920, but it was a V and that's important. It shot down and shot back up. And this will sound awful, but wars cause interest rates to go up because we blow up a bunch of stuff, because we destroy a bunch of stuff, and we have to rebuild it, so it's inflationary. Pandemics don't cause that. Pandemics cause the loss of human capital, but they're still, then the survivors still have all the stuff. So think about a waterless tsunami. What would happen if a tidal wave hit the United States and 130 other countries, but it didn't have any water? It didn't wipe out any property, anything else, but it killed a million people. That's a pandemic. So what does that mean? It means that there's, uh, there's less, fewer people to consume, there's fewer people there, we've got to treat it, we've got to do all these other things. What's instructional is take a look at tax rates. Tax rates went from 15% in 1916 to 63% in 1917 to 78% in 1918, and then stayed up there and then as we got through with the Great Depression of 2021, shot back down, and we had the Roaring Twenties. And the Roaring Twenties gave us a really nice surge, gave us about a 35% increase in GDP per person. And we had all kinds of things going on. It was great, and radio was out, and that was the high technology of the time. And we had the stock market going crazy, and we had everything going fabulous. And then we got to the Great Depression when the stock market bubble caused a good part of this crash coupled with really dumb ideas in DC, like let's tighten up the Fed, let's raise interest rates as we go into a depression. And then notice some brain trust in 1932 decided let's raise the tax rate back up to about 50, over 50%. Uh, you notice tax rates then went up progressively. If you, were in, if you were making money in the 30s, you progressively worked your way up to a horrendous tax rate in 1945 as we won the war, 94%. 94%. And of course, 94% tax rate, and we have all the stuff from World War II, and dads came back, my dad came back, the guy, the guy born in 1917 came back from World War II, uh, happy and, and alive. And 1955, little Leon came along, and 1940, little Helen came along, 1941. So we've got, uh, we've got all those things in there. And then you see the recession in 1949 lasted quite a while, and it was a W. So, V of 20, W of the recession, 
W of the recession after World War II. So we see how this works. I wanna throw another thing in here for us. I wanna cover debt because I'm a debt hawk and uh, it may, it's making me nuts that we're, we've suddenly forgot completely about debt. Um, what I think, I think an endemic problem with any economy is when you get too much debt. When debt gets over 100% of GDP, um, you're, you're usually a sign that you're gonna have very slow growth and very low growth. And I want you to notice in 1945, we were pushing at about 110, 120%. We got up to 126% in 1946. And it gradually worked its way back as the economy recovered and came out of it. But that 126% was pretty, was a, just a dramatic number. Um, by the way, uh, right now, as I see it, uh, I am on the Fed Baseball Committee. So I look at the Fed all the time. This is what nerds do for fun. We look up Fed data. Um, the, rate, uh, the current debt to GDP ratio is about 126%. Fancy that, fancy that. So um, let's carry my chart out a little further. I'm gonna take it out further. And, and by the way, it doesn't look as ominous now. I took it tonight, you know, I took it to World War, end of World War II to go, oh my God, it was terrible. You, know, you notice after World War II, everything just went progressively better and better and better. And a lot of folks, including myself, would say that was due to the, you know, kind of the triumph of democracy, the triumph of us and freedom over all kinds of other things. The, the World War II did basically uh, stop a lot of uh, dialogues. It didn't stop the, the communist uh, socialist versus you know, domestic capitalism argument, but uh, it, it went through a whole bunch of things. You see, we still had glitches. We had the recession of 1970 and the 1973 oil crisis and then 79 oil crisis. And we had a W-shaped recession in 80 and 81. And we had the Great Recession. We had the Iraq War. We've had all kinds of things happen. Uh, please note, that all prior bad things always are followed by something good. And I think that's probably going to be the case again. But if I run this through and put my uh, tax rates on it, you notice the tax rates tend to be very ugly after crises, after crises. And I'm going to theorize to all of us that if I, here, let me put this in perspective. The total amount in 2018 collected in income taxes, total amount of all individual income taxes was $1.7 trillion. Total amount of taxes collected on corporations was about $230 billion. Okay, got that number? So give or take, round it up, $2 trillion. So $2 trillion was all the taxes collected on income for corporations and individuals in a good year, in a good year. Now, we were already running a trillion dollar deficit going into March, and now we have an additional five trillion on top of that. So we have just borrowed six trillion dollars on top of what we were already borrowing. How are you going to pay that? So I'm going to submit to you just simple economics 101. How do you get rid of a deficit? I mean, if you even have the appetite to do that, but how do you pay, how you pay for all this debt? You got to pay for it anyway. You got to pay interest or do something. So you either A, raise taxes, B, cut spending, which no one seems to want to do that. C, inf grow your way out of it. Or D, weaken your currency to get out of it. Or some combination of all of those things. I'll submit that the appetite for you know, raising taxes on the Republican side is very low. The appetite on the Democrat side appears to be higher. I'll, I'll talk about the plan, the tax plan of the candidate. Um, I, I, I will submit that very few people want to spend less money. There does not appear to be anything going on in that regard. And I, I, I'm going to call your attention back to something we always forget about because things get out of our memory. Remember sequestration? Remember when they were going to do sequester because they couldn't agree on the budget and they couldn't agree on the budget, so they just said automatically, we're going to cut federal spending and freeze it in other devices. And remember the predictions, oh my gosh, cows are going to give red milk and planes are going to fall out of the sky and everything's going to be terrible and no one's going to get their mail. And what happened? Nothing except that we got rid of some deficit. We got $200 billion out of the budget because we didn't spend it, because we found out we were spending it in places we didn't know anyway. It's, it's kind of like COVID. I just noticed how much stuff I don't need. I said, oh my God, I gotta go to the gym. Eh, I can go, I'll go for a walk. I guess I didn't really need the gym. Oh, I gotta go get a haircut. Eh, I can get a haircut later. I'm okay with that. Oh, I, we gotta go out to dinner. We gotta do social, we gotta do this. I, I do miss baseball. Gotta have some baseball, please. Please. But the idea here is we see things that we didn't necessarily notice before. So I, I am going to submit we're going to probably have a tax increase, and I'll talk about why. 
Uh, here's the debt numbers. You can see the debt numbers, and I haven't brought in the, the latest. This is just what I have in basic parts, but you can see debt surges up, recession, debt surges up, recession, debt surges up, oops. And uh, I, think, I think we've got this as a major, major problem. And then here's the Fed's balance sheet. Um, this is again, what people like me like to look at. I like, what does the Fed's balance sheet look like? Um, I was alarmed back here in February when it was around 4.2 trillion. It's really fun to look at a chart like this because the column says 4 million, that's 4 million million, which is an interesting thing. So um, it started at 420, it is boosted up to where it is right now, which is an astronomical $7 trillion on the Fed's balance sheet. Um, by the way, Good news is it's going down. The good news is the Fed's balance sheet is starting to clean up a little bit, and that does give me a waiver of hope. By the way, I don't want anybody to think who's listening to think I don't really admire what the Fed's done. Uh, Powell is a hero, gets an A plus in my opinion. He has been an extraordinary Fed chair. And uh, as a nerd, I pride my, you know, I'm like a rock groupie. I got to meet Ben Bernanke and talk to him for a little bit. Amazing fellow, amazing, brilliant fellow. I got to meet Chairman Yellen. She's amazing. Oh my gosh, just in street smart and savvy and, and amazing. Uh, I can't wait if I can ever get a chance to meet uh, Chairman Powell. I will just say, wow, what a great job you did. I mean, he really, really, I think, helped us work our way through this problem. And remember, he was in a problem. He didn't know what the problem was. He had to solve it on his own. I thought I'd throw the market on just for fun. Um, here's, here's what it looks like. This is what, what's so interesting about this chart is it starts with a dollar. So in 1870, if you had a dollar and you put it in the uh, stock market, uh, it, it basically worked its all the way up to uh, $19,000 by March and by February. And by March, it would have been down to 15,000. By the way, right, but not right now, it would be back to about uh, $18,000. Uh, notice the market does not go in a straight line. It tends in a line and it also goes in steps. It goes up and then goes flat goes up, and then it goes flat, it goes up, and then it goes flat, it goes up, and then it goes flat. And it already went up, and it could be this little square root that a friend of mine has been telling me is the shape of the recovery. We're going to get a, a V followed by a straight line. That's possible. I'll be okay with that. I, you know, I like the V. I want a V. Um, let's take those letters for a sec. Um, a V is a V-shaped recovery is just what it sounds like, like a Super Bowl. Goes down, comes back up. Markets act in a V right now. And market usually is a precursor of the economy. So if that's correct, then the market has voted that we're in for a V. We will see now as earnings come out for this quarter what things really look like. But um, I think it could be a little overrated, but the V is there. I'm kind of leaning toward the square root. A U is when it goes down, stays down. So that was when the real estate market went to heck in uh, 2008. And your Florida real estate went down and it stayed down. And it stayed down for a long time and didn't recover for a long time. Uh, U's take a lot longer. The Great Recession was a U. When we had the Great Recession in 08, 09, 07, 09, that thing stayed down for 18 months. That was a really long period. So that's a long U. A W is when we have a bounce down and a bounce back up and then a bounce down again. So that was 1980. If you remember 1980, most of us don't, but, and some of us are too young to even remember 1980 because we were a twinkle in dad's eye then. But in 1980, uh, I was paying a 13.6% mortgage, and I was happy about it. I thought, oh my gosh, this is great, 13.6%. I mean, you know, inconceivable interest rates. Ronald Reagan fired the air traffic controllers for going on strike. The inflation rate was hovering around, you know, it was, it was way up there. And we, you know, the Iran, uh, we had the Iranian hostage crisis. All of these things were going on at the same time. We had a recession in 1980. It bounced back, just barely made a recovery, and then went right back down again and went into another recession. So we had recession hit recession. Um, I think a lot of economists, myself included, are thinking if this infection vector goes crazy, which it appears it's not going to, we're hoping, I'm gonna talk a little bit about infection vector in a minute. Um, the infection vector, uh, we get a reinfection, and we have to re-shut down, then we get this W. And Ws are actually almost uglier than Us. Us set us down and give us certain ways of looking at things. Uh, Ws give us a we dash a hope, and then they, they take it away from us and snag it out of our, our, our faces. Um, I thought I'd play around a little bit with retail. Um, this is just, I took, I took a rough period. I took from uh, April 24th through March 7th, and I just wanted to look at different retail spots. I mean, no surprise that uh, travel and hotels and hospitality are dead. I mean, look, at, look in, in April, they were down 112%. How can something be down 112%? They're giving refunds. So, you know, travel was way, way off. Entertainment was way, way off. 
But surprisingly, restaurants. I mean, I, if I were looking for poster children of what got killed in the middle of this pandemic, I'd say, God, it had to be restaurants. They were down 46%, but by, by May, they were down 36%. And you'd think, no, no one's going on transit. No, transit was only down 55%. And gas was only, gas was down 41%. Clothing, though, you know, well, people still got to wear clothes, but apparently now we all wear jeans and, you know, or, or shorts when we're doing our, our Zooms. But clothing went from negative 53% to negative 39. Look at furniture, negative 16 to seven. You know, so it's, it's wait a minute. And then of course, no big surprise, online electronics in the, in the late April, everybody was buying routers and everything. And on the payday effect of, of May 1st, we had 155% surge in online electronics of people buying new TV sets and everything else. I know I bought one, but um, you've got all these things in here. A big surprise, total online retail. Uh, online retail, definitely up. Uh, definitely went in their home improvement up. So it wasn't the retail and the residential, you know, the, the consumption apocalypse that we thought. I wanted to make another comparison, and this was actually just through the downside of this whole thing. Gold bar is, uh, is tw in 2019, uh, blue bar is 2020. As you'd expect, April, everything was awful. Nobody was buying anything in early April. It was down like crazy. And then by the end of May, it was almost back to normal. And that's credit card data, credit card spending. And then if I get to daily retail, 2020 by early May was actually above 2019. Weird, huh? You, you would have thought, oh my God, retail's terrible. No, retail wasn't as terrible. It was really terrible for a while, and then it got better. Uh, by the way, there's an interesting spike if you look in mid-March, right at the beginning of March. I'm presuming that the giant spike in 2020 was purchases of toilet paper and Clorox. Um, what did they spend their money on? I wanted to know that. Uh, no surprise, they didn't spend it on entertainment, they didn't spend it on travel, that's down almost 100%. But the interesting part is essentials definitely increased and you had an increase in spending, so wild. And then I actually wanted to see what happened when they got the CARE stimulus package. Uh, no surprise, people got the stimulus and spent it. And that went out and credit card spending went up like crazy during that time frame. I am again worried, like I said earlier, about what happens when this is over and now we have to go back to normal now we're back to having a job and paying taxes and paying student loan payments and all those other things and and we recover back to the normal life and we're not getting extra pieces um i thought i'd play with some chinese data um i know somebody's going to say what i said when i read this yeah it's chinese data how much can i rely on uh but i just i took the data from uh january through may in january there are no cases in china on covid by february 7th there were 21,000 and 17,000 and then uh, in May, by May, there was 54. Um, but I wanted to see what happened with other things, like, like box office revenue. Box office revenue uh, in, in January, when there were no cases, was $300 million. Uh, zero in all throughout the pandem their pandemic. No one went to theaters because you weren't allowed to go to a theater. But look at the subway traffic. Subway traffic was 7, 000, uh, 7 million passengers. And then in Shanghai, it's back to 5.7 by May. Car sales really surprised me. Car sales dropped 92% in February. Nine, of course, no one was buying a car in China because you couldn't go anywhere anyway. They're only down 7% by the end of May. And the one thing that I always say is organisms live on energy. And so what happens with electricity demand and power demand and power plant coal inventory changes? They're only down 5% in China by the end of May. Uh, they were down 67% early March and May. So if, if this is an a indication if China is an indication, if we can trust the number, um, then the indication says that we've probably got a V-shaped recovery if I'm using that dashboard. At least gives us hope that we do. I'm not, I'm not able to say we are. Uh, there is what I'm hearing a super growth, a Super Bowl case for U.S. equities, and that is, you know, the S&P 500 was on a pre-pandemic growth path and it went down and shot right back up. Uh, the earning estimates went down. And you know it's possible that the stock market theoretically could shoot back right through that line and keep going. It certainly is acting like it. I'm not a super bull. Um, I am more protective right now. In fact, right now I'm feeling a little bearish, uh, but I, uh, I think that could clearly happen. I thought it might be worth us talking a little bit about hotspots. This is the most recent piece. Um, Arizona ratio of positive tests for the recent low was 0.08. Now it's 0.13, it's got a 62% increase. Arizona has a GDP for its uh, state of $366 billion, just right around the same as Michigan. 
uh, about 1.7% of GDP. Oklahoma's got a spike going. They went from 0.03 to 0.04, 21% increase. Florida's got a 0.1 increase, 20% increase. Texas, 17% increase. California's number of cases is only 1.3. Um, media is funny. You know, they've got uh, millions of hours and millions and millions of bytes of information to give us, and they don't always give us all the information. Everybody's looking at this. You know what I looked at too, though? Deaths are not up. So you do not have a 62% increase in deaths in Arizona. You have a 62% increase in cases, but not a 62% increase in deaths. So um, I think a lot of us are saying, wait a minute, the deaths are much more important than the cases. Um, this is just an argument on case versus deaths. I thought I'd pop in. Unemployment rate, it's still historically high. Uh, it's still pushing at about 13%. Enormous surprise a couple of weeks ago when it just came through. And uh, I was really surprised by the, uh, the unemployment numbers. There was an error in the number, but it wasn't a significant enough error to make a difference. It is surprising how many people come back. I will be uh, looking eagerly to see what the June numbers look like and then finally what the July numbers look like. Uh, I know a lot of folks have gotten PPP loans, and that's changed a lot of things in how we, how we do things, but it's out there. Uh, this is a, a May 31st to June 5th poll on Trump versus Biden. It's, it's, it spreads bigger now. Uh, but right now it's about a 10 point spread uh, in favor of Biden over Trump. And that was the, that's all the polls seem to be favoring the same thing. After 2016, I don't pay attention to polls very much, but it is an interesting part. I pay attention to the Vegas lines. The Vegas line is a 10 point uh, spread on Biden over Trump for now. I thought we should talk a little bit about uh, tax plans. And this is uh, Biden's tax and spending plan. And I do want to hit on this. Left-hand side is the taxation. Uh, he wants to apply the 12.4 payroll tax above $400,000 split between employers and employees. Uh, that's going to raise $900 billion. What does that mean? It means that most of us pay into Social Security until you hit about the $139,000 ceiling. He wants to take that ceiling off and have everybody pay into Social Security all the way uh, to $400,000 or more. He wants to raise the corporate tax rate to 28%. That raises about $1.3 billion. Uh, that, that's a split the difference between 35 and 21, which uh, probably has some potential negative tax effects and negative market effects. Wants to raise the top rate back to 39.6% and limit any other deductions. Uh, he wants to tax capital gains as ordinary income for people who make more than a million dollars and have no step up in basis on death, uh, which means that you'd have a carryover basis and that means kids would pay capital gains on inherited assets. He wants to have certain uh, industry-specific taxes on commercial and multifamily real estate. I'm curious on how, why, what the rationale is behind that. Why are we taxing that? But we'll figure that one out. Uh, raise the global intangible low tax rate. Uh, foreign taxes, raising an effective corporate tax on non-U.S. profits by $309 billion. Phase out the pass-through deduction above four hundred k. Remember, by the way, that, that falls off anyway. All of us right now are scheduled to get a tax increase, almost all of us. Almost all of us are scheduled to get a tax increase on uh, January 1st, 2026. Tax Cuts and Jobs Act does expire then. Then a $15 million tax on book income, a 15% minimum tax on book income, just a, basically a corporate version of minimum tax, and then other things like uh, changing the estate tax, uh, some other pieces in there. So you're talking $4 trillion tax increase. I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna break down what I think it means. Uh, you got spending increases of $6 trillion, not a big surprise. Let's Let's tax more and spend more. Um, and I, the, the issue we should all look at is whether there's a wave and the Senate, House, and presidency goes uh, in one party. I did want to look at what happened, and I'll take that up in a moment about what happens. Here's a comparison of the tax plans. Right now, the current top capital gains rates, 20%. Under the Biden plan, 39.6. Top ordinary income rate, 37 versus 39.6. Top corporate rate, 21 versus 28. Estate tax exemption, 11.5 versus 5.45. Top estate tax rate, 40%. Uh, step up in basis, no step up in basis, and a cap, eliminate the cap on Social Security taxes. Uh, estate taxes, if we use the Biden plan, which is just to accelerate the, ex the, um, to accelerate the expiration, uh, we would see a difference of about a 32% effective tax rate to a 24% rate on a $30 million state. 
uh, I wanted to see, you know, everybody's going, oh, it's going to be a disaster if there's one party in power. Although I heard alarming news that Elizabeth Warren may be the Secretary of Treasury, which actually scares me more than uh, control of one party. So we went back to 1881. The average rate of return on the S&P 500 since 1881 was about 6.4%. Surprisingly, uh, when the Democrats were in control, it was 6.7%. So you actually did better than average under Democratic control. Under Republican control, you made 9.9%. Not, again, too much of a surprise since traditionally, I would say, Republicans tend to be pro-business. In split governments, though, it tended to be 5.2. Um, recently, by the way, that's been better. If I take it from 1980 on, uh, it's actually been the best thing you can hope for as a split government. So your, your best, whatever your political affiliation is, hope for some, somebody throwing it off because the recent history tells us that's a better thing for us. So what do you go do? I think there's some really important things right now. You, you have to understand what you're doing in terms of your financial planning timeframe. And I think all of us as business owners ought to be thinking about how this shakes out. Is it going to be a V? Is it going to be a U? Is it going to be a W? I didn't talk about the L. The L is we go down and stay down, and it seems to me eminently that we're not going that way. Um, I think right now liquidity is important. I think all of us should recognize cash as king, and I, I am advising my clients to have more cash on hand, uh, both personally and business-wise. Uh, you have to evaluate your capacity to shift your objectives, and that could be with your business or otherwise. I, I know this will sound Machiavellian, but I believe these kinds of times give us opportunities. There will be other people not able to foreshadow this and think about what they're doing, and there's going to be other people not considering what's going on. And I, I say scout your competition, look at your competition, see what you can go do. And then, obviously, see if there are planning opportunities now. I think taxes are going up, so I'm telling people, let's look at Roth conversions. Let's look at Roth IRAs. Let's put more money into Roth. Let's get that out of the way. There's a, a law called SECURE that passed at the end of 2019 that basically made it so that your IRA goes to your kids over 10 years and they have to pay the taxes over 10 years on the death of both spouses. So that's a, you know, that's a danger right there. That's another piece that we've got to go look at. Should we be doing Roth conversion? Should I loan money to my kids? Should I sell part of my business to my kids through a trust? Is there a wealth transfer idea that I should be looking at? Because I, I, I think for a lot of us who are business owners, um, a lot of these tax things could come back to bite us as well. And we want to figure out how to get around that. I mean, my, my blessing to all of us is I hope you're in the highest tax bracket and I hope you're subject to federal estate taxes. And in the case of that, then you have to figure out how to do something about it. So I, at that juncture, um, I'd like to take some questions. I'm going to stop my share. And if we have any questions, pop them up on Q&A or ask through. If we've got questions on Facebook, feel free to to, to ask us, um, we'll go through that. Lori, got any, come up with anything? Just a, a couple questions here. It's been actually a pretty uh, quiet group. Uh, this information is, is uh, great, Leon. Thank you. The, so intense at what you provided. Um, especially knowing now that the Vegas line on the election is a great resource, right, for um, predicting what might happen. So thank you for sharing that with us. I, I love that. But um, in all seriousness, when do you anticipate we'll have an idea if we're in a V recovery, hopefully we are, or a U or a W? When do you anticipate we'll have a good idea? Um, people smarter than me tell me that you watch the infection vector and the death vector. So if the infector, infection vector, which is already picked up, if the infection vector picks up dramatically and goes back to where it was and the death rate goes back to where it was, then we're probably looking at a W um, sooner than later. If the market's true, then the market's already voted on the V. So the market's voted the V, and the market says we're done with this. My friends at the Fed tell me that the data is starting to show significant optimism coming out of where we're going and, and what's happening there. Um, the PPP loans have given a lot of boost into the economy. There's a lot on the Fed balance sheet. And, and, and I'm looking at, Lori, the money supply has been uh, dramatically increased. So the money supply has gone right through the roof. And that's almost always a good sign. See, it's, it's like we've, we've built up a, a large pile. I can liken this when I was a Boy Scout. When I was a Boy Scout, you were supposed to light a, you were supposed to light a fire with one match. They gave you one match, go light the fire. So if you studied your Boy Scout manual, you're supposed to go get some birch bark and cut it with your little Boy Scout knife and make a little pile of it. It's like a nest. And then you're supposed to put a teepee of little twigs around it and then make a little log cabin of other things. And then you light the match and it goes out. And it goes out. So then you go steal some newspaper or some toilet paper and you put it in there and try to get it to work. And then you try to light it and you, your match goes out. So then you go to the scoutmaster's tent and you steal all those white gas and you dump it all over it and you throw it in and go whoosh. 
And I'm, I'm wondering if we got a white gas situation here that we've thrown, I mean, think this out. Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was $1.5 trillion. We've thrown three times that much money into this economy right now. Now, go to Vegas. People didn't do all those other things, but we threw $5 trillion onto the fire, which is the Super Bowl argument that this could go whoosh. And uh, I'm, I was originally a U, a U candidate. I thought this was going to be a U. Of course, this was back in March when everything looked like the world was ending. Um, now I'm seeing that we're getting things coming back the right way. There are success stories. Michigan has lowered its infection rate dramatically. I think you and I were talking earlier. If people actually do practice social distancing and practice, you know, safe practices, it can stop it. We can get back to work and go get back to our businesses. So I, I think that in this case, you know, we are going to see the potential of the V. Now, I don't think we'll get an L, and I think there's also this trajectory on a vaccine. Uh, Oxford University has a great vaccine that uh, AstraZeneca is going to be doing 400 million units of. Uh, Gilead has a treatment, not a vaccine. So if the vaccine hits before the reinfection vector, I think we're golden. The vaccine will be here. We will get it. And then we'll be on to the regular thing and be talking about supercomputers and electric cars and all the other stuff that we talked about in a different fashion, maybe like this. Sorry for the long answer, but I love talking about this. Well, someone else has a question regarding the different shapes. Uh, you had mentioned the square root shape recovery. Could you just explain that briefly? Even though we don't anticipate that's happening? Yeah, think of the square root sign if you... Okay. Yeah, well, square root sign is a V, and then it goes up higher, and then it goes flat. So if you think of, you know, if you're drawing, go back to math when you're in, in uh, grade school and in junior high. Um, a square root sign is a V coupled with a long straight line. And the reason I think we could have that one, the square root sign, is we get the V because we re recover back and the Fed's thrown $5 trillion into the economy. And then we get the flat line because we've got to pay for the darn thing. I mean, just do quick math and pay 2% on $5 trillion. And look at what we just added to the budget deficit. Then take out all the taxes we're not collecting. Then throw in what we've, we've spent on this whole thing. And it's, it's crazy. It's just a, there's, so it, it's possible we do the down, up, and then flat for a while. And I wouldn't be surprised. Actually, that's kind of the coolest one, mainly because it's unique. Everybody's talking B, W, U. And we came up with a whole new letter, the square root sign. So I kind of like the square root sign. I might be, I might be a fan of that one. Great. Uh, someone else asked another question here. How much of the recent rise in stock market is due to the lack of sports betting and an increase firms like Robinhood that have almost gamified investing along with no fees? Well, um, there's two parts to that question. One is the no fee, which is there's lots of no fee now. You can go to Fidelity or Schwab and get no fee investing. Um, without sounding too trite about it, Robinhood is rounding change to the real market. Um, I can you know, take you to show you bet hedge fund managers. There's a joke in my business that don't count on what the stock market's doing until three o'clock when the, when the hedge fund managers put away their coffee and get to work. So when the hedge fund managers get to work and start going, to the, and when, they're, when they launch, they launch so much money into the market at a time, it's, just, uh, it's, an, it's an inconceivable amount. Um, I think Robinhood and some of these other things have taken people away from sports betting to a degree, um, but I would, I would pose that it's, that's rounding change compared to what the real, where the real money is. The retail investor, it doesn't move the market anywhere near as much as a, a Fidelity or a AIG or someone like that. You get one of the, or you get one of these huge ones. You get Ray Dalio's you know, group going after something that changes everything. Warren Buffett, by the way, has just been building up cash. Wait till he redeploys his cash. Wait till, wait till Berkshire Hathaway redeploys cash. It's gonna be crazy, it's gonna be amazing. Great, thank you. Well, that's it on the questions. Last call, if you have a question, please post it. Uh, Leanne, I do have a couple of folks that said thank you. They loved your presentation, and they're inquiring if uh, you are seeking new clients. Is your contact information on the slides, or if not, we'll make sure it's out there when we post it later. Yeah. If folks want to reach out to you. Excellent. Sure. Anybody wants to reach out to me, um, Google me on Sequoia Financial. Uh, Google my Forbes article. I make seven thousandths of a cent every time you read it. So go read my Forbes article. That'd be great. Um, I, I, we do take new clients, and I would be happy to talk to anybody, answer you know, answer any questions, those kinds of things. Uh, you know, talk about some of the portfolios I run, so. Well, thank you. Uh, it's great to have you back on the webinar today. Uh, I love the information you shared. Uh, before we go, I just wanted to mention that we are doing, uh, the next webinar, July 15th, is the Civility Project with Michigan's own uh, Nolan Finley and Stephen Henderson. 
If you tuned in on the annual meeting, you've got a little taste of that, but they will be doing a one hour civility project session on Wednesday, July 15th at 2 p.m. And that comes to us, I believe, from the uh, Delta Dental Foundation. They are partners with that. So thank you again to the Michigan Association of CPAs and Leanne for being here today. I uh, appreciate it so much. No other questions? We'll say goodbye. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. Bye-bye.